بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعه داه إلى يوم الدين ثم ما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today is going to be a very quick class بإذن الله جل جلاله um, so let's start with عقيدة إن شاء الله تعالى مختصر معارج القبول So today's topic that we're going to speak about in معارج القبول is the issue of إرادة الله the issue of the will of Allah right this is a subject matter that's important to understand when we talk about the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're talking about His will in two different ways, or two different aspects of His will. What is known as sifa, as a characteristic, and what is known as koni, or qadari. Right? Or qadariya, yani irada qadariya koniya. And this is about His will in His decree. And his creation. His will is decree and, and his creation, and his will in his character. That's a different, separate one. Now, to further make you understand what we mean by what we mean by will as a characteristic. Basically, what Allah, when we talk about this type of will or want of Allah, we're talking about what Allah is loves and is pleased with. What Allah loves for us to do, what Allah loves to happen. And what he's pleased that it happens. Which is different than the decree, the qadr, and what he has created, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the world to go in a certain direction. And he's created certain people to go in a certain direction. Right? That's from the qadr. That's from, that's from Allah's want as far as what he has decreed. But... What Allah loves for his servants and love for his slave and love to happen is a different type of want and will that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. So how do we know that these two different types of will or want, they exist? Well, let's give you the example of the first one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah An-Nisa, Yuridullahu an yatubu alaykum. Wait, you read Allah on YouTube or alaykum? Read Allah on YouTube. No, you read Allah li yubayyina lakum wa yahdi alladheena min qablikum wa yatubu alaykum wallahu alimun hakim. Allah says he wants to clarify for you and guide those before you. And that, and, uh, وَيَهْدِيَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَيَتُوبُ عَلَيْكُمْ Hold on, I'm saying something. يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُبَيْنَكُمْ وَيَهْدِيَكُمْ سُنَنَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَيَتُوبُ عَلَيْكُمْ Yeah, no. So, Allah says that He wants to clarify for you and to guide you to the way of those before you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alim, all-knowing, Hakim, all wise. Now what is God trying to say here? God is trying to say that He wills, He wishes to clarify for us. But does that mean that everyone will receive clarity? No. But this is what He wants for His creation. This is what He wants for His creation. This is another type of will, right? This is another type of will. This is what Allah loves to happen for His servant. He wants good for all of His servants. But not all of his servants is deserving of good. Right? He wants good to happen to all of his servants. But not everything that happens to his servants will be good. Right? And there's wisdom behind that. And we'll get to that bi ibn ta'ala. Then Allah, he says, Wallahu yuridu and yatubu alaykum 
and Allah wants to um, accept your repentance. وَيُرِيدُ الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الشَّهَوَاتِ and تَمِيلُ مِلًا عَظِيمًا And He wants those who follow desires that they deviate from that a great deal. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضعيفة. And Allah wishes, He wills, He wants to alleviate you. And mankind is created weak. And mankind is created weak. So these right here, this right here is showing the different wills of Allah that has to do with what He loves for His servants, what He wants to happen. And it's not about what He has created, the will in which He has created within His creation, within His decree. Certain things have to take place. Right? That is different. So those are the two different wills of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so as far as the second one, the second example or an example of the second will that we uh, we spoke about, the will of Allah's qadr and His creation, is in Allah's statement, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah," And you do not will or you do not want except for, or that it is in line with that which Allah wants. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed everything that you're going to do. He knows everything that you're going to do. So even though you're the one who wants to do that action, it only comes after the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had willed it. Because that is part of the decree. So that is the other side of the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... You got a, you got a question? Go ahead, because I was just gonna you know kind of like uh, you know um, I bridge everything up. I'm pretty much done, so go ahead. I'll go. You done with? You? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. I don't know if you talked about this or not, but this, the whole the hadith in terms of du'a and the decree. Mm -hmm. So, and it's I've heard this, and you tell me if this is a Sahih hadith or not. Mm -hmm. That the du'a goes up in the decree and. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Barely, you know, the dua and so on and so forth. So could you explain that? Because some people have this idea that the creed never, it never ever changes. And I was of the opinion, Allah just changed one decree from another decree. Okay. Both are right. Both are correct. And I'll explain how that is. Well, first let me uh, mention what the brother just said. The brother asked about the issue of dua. And uh, dua's ability to change the the decree okay there are there are two ways in which what is going to be happen is written down right there's a low mahfu there's a prescribed tablet that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he written down everything that is going to happen will happen could have happened from the beginning of time uh, until the end until after that never changes. But there is another, how do you say, um, another level of text that is written down that does change with dua. But the thing is that the fact that you're going to make dua and the fact that that is going to change, that is written already in the preserved tablets. Right? That's that's not that tablet doesn't change. But the other one, the other deeds or the other decree that has been written down, the one that is a, at a lower level, you know, that is subject to change. That can change. Right? And that and even though the fact that you made decree you made dua was already written down and it was already decreed, that changes and stuff like that. But then the you, the question goes then, does it really change since it, the fact that you were gonna make dua? And that, you know, that is going to... Okay, let me try to explain it to you. Like, um, when we talk about the Lord Mahfud, the Lord Mahfud, or preserved tablet, as, as it's translated is, it, it is something that talks about the long game, right? So it goes from the beginning of time till the end. And then there is... Things that happen like on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, 
right? These are short span um, events that could, should take place. So let's say, for example, that it is written that you're going to, and Allah, you know, Allah forbids, that you're going to be in an accident tomorrow. Right? That's written down on the decree for a short agility, like in a short time span. So you make Fajr, and after Fajr, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you. You when you go outside your house, you make the dua for exiting the house, you make dua for getting in your car, and all of that because you made those dua, what should have happened when you went outside has changed for that time period, for that time span, right? So you change what would have happened in that day, for example. But even though you've changed the decree for that day, you did not change the decree of everything that has been, what was, that is in the lower mahfu that was going to happen and what will happen, right? Because the fact that that was going to change is already in that prescribed tablet. And that prescribed tablet doesn't change. But those little short um, span, time span, that is what uh, is susceptible to change. But like I said, it doesn't really change. So it's looked at in those two type of um, views, in those two type of points. That's how it's been explained. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So does dua change acts? And events, yes it does. Depending on how you look at it. If we look at it from the lower mahfud, from the prescribed tablet, no it doesn't. What Allah has decreed uh, is, is set. But if we talk about it from a specific, like you know, from a more um, short time span, dealing with you, dealing with what was supposed to happen with you in a very short time span, um, in those books that's written for your lifespan, and so forth, because remember the angels, they have that knowledge, right? They know what's going to happen to you from that person's birth to the end. And that can change, but that does not change in the prescribed tablet. So basically all the changes that could happen or that does happen, even that has been decreed, basically. So... Both parties are correct. The fact that dua does bring about change, but the issue is that you know even those changes were already decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that you decided to make dua was already decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So with that, the issue of want and will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think it's pretty straightforward as far as there being the two types. One is what Allah wills, meaning that he loves this to happen for his servant, and he loves this to take place. And these are things that we know, how do we know Allah loves something to happen? Because he commands us to do it. And, how, uh, and, and he commands us not to do it, certain things. right? So that's the type of will that Allah has in one aspect. And then we have the will where Allah has decreed things to happen, like he has decreed rain to fall, he has decreed flood to happen if it, over, if it rains too much. And he has decreed that, you know, certain people will die at certain times. These are the decree of Allah. And he's decreed that certain people will believe and certain people will not. And even that, even though that is the, the, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is still a choice that we make. But because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows our choices, knows what we will choose, it makes it easy uh, for us to understand when we see certain people move a certain way, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we don't know. Like, like that person is really good. They seem considerate. They seem like, you know, they care about family members. They care about other people, their neighbors and things like that. Why isn't it? Why aren't they Muslim? Then you have this dude over here that he Muslim, but, you know, <laughs> he does and he does... I mean, he barely like, you know, tethering on the borderline of being a Kafir. You know, with a, with a certain acts and, you know, things like that, you know. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here's the thing that we have to understand. When we think about abuse, right? What do we think of a person that would abuse their own mother? And even though after, and he abuses his mother, but then when he goes out into the world, he's nice to everybody else. How would we think of that person? How would we conceptualize that person? We would think that that person is good, even though they're good to everybody else, give to charity, everything like that. But then he goes home and he abuses his mother. See, when we think about something like that, we say, no, that's not a good person, no matter what he does. How can you forgive him for abusing his mother? Likewise, how can somebody be forgiven for abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? By not giving him his rights. By saying that he doesn't exist. By saying that he has a son. By saying that I have the option of doing whatever I want. And Allah will forgive me. Even though he has said other than that. These are all abuses that people do to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are forms of abuse. So how can we look at the person who abuses his mother and then do good deeds other than that? And we understand that that does not justify, it does not wipe away that act. But yet we can't understand that those people who disbelieve in Allah are doing the exact same thing to somebody who has more right to be respected, more right to be praised, more right to be loved than anyone's mother. Because without him, none of this would mean a thing. Without Allah, Jalla Jalla. Okay. So with that, we're going to move on. Like I said, I, want, I wanted to keep this class uh, kind of short. So let's move on to hadith, inshallah ta'ala. And we're on the, um, the 22nd hadith, the hadith of Jabir. Where it says, An Abi Abdullah Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. So Jabir... His kunya is Abdullah. That means he has a son named Abdullah. And his father's name is Abdullah. Radiallahu an Anna rajulan sa'ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqal. Ara'ayta idh salaytul maktubat wa sumtu ramadan wa ahlaltul halala wa haramtul harama adkhul al jannah. So this person, this individual, Jabir saw this happen. He went to the Prophet wasallam and he said, What are your thoughts about if I was to pray my obligatory prayers and fast during Ramadan and everything that Allah has made permissible, I do it. Right, everything he commands to do, I do it. Everything that's halal, I partake in it. And everything that he has prohibited us from, I stay away from it. Would that allow me to enter Jannah? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes. He said, yes. Okay, so... Imam Anawi... When he placed this hadith in his 40 hadith, he explained what it means by making something halal, halal. Right? Something that is halal, making it halal. And something that is haram, making it haram. Meaning that something that is halal, you do it, believing that it is permissible to you, for you to do that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that this is okay for you to partake in. And making something haram, that is haram, meaning that you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this haram. So what are some of the benefits of this hadith? One is we see once again how diligent the companions are when it comes to wanting to know what would benefit their religion and how they can be successful 
in the hereafter. That is one of the most important things of this hadith. And another important thing is the importance of the salat. The importance of the salat. And of course we're talking about the obligatory salat. But uh, scholars would like to caution, and this is when uh, it's important for us to understand, and it's a reminder for you guys as well as me, the importance of doing the optional acts of worship, including those attached to the prayer, so optional prayers. Because if you do the optional prayers, and then you're slack in that, then you're not really at detriment. You know, you're not, it's not going to affect you that much. And the doing the optionals will help keep your obligatories in line. Because the optional prayers, they complete any deficiencies that you have in your obligatory prayers. Right? So if you're not attentive in your obligatory prayers, or if you made a mistake in your recitation, all of these different deficiencies that could happen in your obligatory prayers, doing those optional prayers, they help complete that. Likewise, doing the optional prayers make you stay steadfast in doing your obligatory, obligatory prayers because they're connected. I mean, how are you going to pray the Sunnah for Fajr if you're not awake for Fajr? How are you going to pray the Sunnahs for Dhor if you make Dhor go out? You know, so it doesn't make sense. So if someone is diligent, if they're steadfast in making sure they hold on to those optional, then of course it means that they're going to be holding on to the obligatory. Now sometimes, some people, they, they kind of mess up when it comes to Tahajjud. Right? Like you have these people that they, oh, I want to pray Tahajjud, I want to pray Tahajjud, I want to pray the night prayer. So you see them, some of them, you know, they pray Fajr, I mean they pray Isha, and they'll stay up. And I'm guilty of some of this stuff. They stay up. You know, because they know that if they go to sleep, they're going to miss Tahajjud. And they want to make Tahajjud. So they stay up, Tahajjud comes in, the time for Tahajjud, the, 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 the best time to pray Tahajjud comes in, you know, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, they, they, they pray Tahajjud. After they pray Tahajjud, they're tired. So I say, man, I got like about 2, two 3 hours, maybe I can get like, you know, an hour nap, something like that in. They lay down, they don't wake up until after the sun rises. So they miss Fajr. So they had the enthusiasm to do something Hoping, optional, hoping to get the reward for it, you know, the reward from Allah because of the, the great rewards that is in praying Salat to Tahajjud. But in doing so, they miss something that's obligatory, which is Fajr. If the case is like that, and you know yourself, don't do that. The obligatory prayers is more beloved to Allah for you to strive to make those than making any Tahajjud or any optional prayer. No doubt. No doubt. Okay. Let me see. What else is there? Um, the importance of the, the fasting in Ramadan. This hadith shows that importance as well. And that's it. So that hadith was pretty straightforward. Any uh, questions in that? Let me see if there's any questions. Maybe I missed something from the people that are listening. Okay, wa alaikum salam wa barakatuh. Okay, so no questions it seems like. At least not I can tell. Okay. So that's the hadith. The hadith is pretty straightforward. So let's go to um, Sira. And for the Sira, we're just going to cover something very small. So last time for Sira, we talked about the hijrah that some of the, the early companions made. The hijrah comprised of four women... 12 men. Where did they make Hijra to? The four women and 12 men. Ah, yes. Abyssinia, or what's known as Ethiopia now. Right? So, and they made, they made uh, Hijra there twice. So there were two groups. Right, some people they when they thought that um, Quraysh had stopped torturing the Muslims, they went back uh, just to find out that you know it was a lie. Quraysh was still torturing and, and abusing the Muslims. 
So they went back with a larger group. And the group consists of 83 men and 18 women this time. So first it was four women, 12 men. Now it is 83 men and 18 women. So that was the second hijra or migration to Ethiopia or Abyssinia. And this happened in what year of the Hijrah? What year? No, 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 no. The one to uh, the one to Ethiopia. When did that happen? I, I thought that it could only be considered the Hijrah once they went to Medina. No. Cause what is Hijrah? The definition of Hijrah is. Yes, yes, but I mean, it's Turku Balad, uh, Balad al Kufr, Ila Balad al Islam. It's basically the definition, right? The, the definition of uh, Hijrah is leaving the land of the disbelievers to the land of the believers, right? That's, that's the, general, um, the general definition. But Abyssinia, going to Abyssinia is considered like a minor Hijrah. Like, you know, it's not the full hijra. It's not the hijra that fits in the definition. But it's basically leaving a place of hardship to a place of lesser hardship. You know, even though... It, it, the, but the thing is that, you know, we know that uh, the king, he did become Muslim and stuff. Even though he was not able to, you know, be outward with his Islam, like declare his Islam and stuff like that. But he became Muslim. So that with, with so within that sense, they were able to practice their religion freely, which is the which is the reason why you make hijra, and that's the reason why we have this debate going on now whether or not Muslims that live in America or in anywhere in the West do they need to leave? You know that comes up because people are saying some people are saying no, you have to leave because hijra is oblig obligatory because there's a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that. The Muslims should not be able to see the fire, the camping fire of the disbelievers. I mean, they shouldn't be even that close where they can see the camping fire of the disbelievers. So a lot of people, they use that hadith to say that uh, um, hijra is obligatory. But then the other scholars, they use the hadith talking about the sirah of the companions going to Habasha to show that you don't need to leave the land of the disbelievers and stuff like that. Why Hijra, the reason why Hijra was something that was legislated is because of hardship code. You have to be able to practice your religion no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of people, especially the worst deaners, <laughs> the worst deaners, they hold on to that, saying that we can practice our religion here in America. We are American Muslims and things like that. We're able to practice our religion. So, what's the issue? And it's true, right? But now, when we look at some of the... The thing is, though, that... Laws can change. So we have to be ready for those instances when the laws change and they do make it difficult on the Muslims. We got to be ready to leave. Like the people in France, the Muslims in France, they're telling the sisters that they can't cover and things like that. They can't go to school covered. And all that. If they can't find a solution to that, then they have no choice but to leave. And there are other um, non-Muslim places where it's difficult to practice. But some people have we have to keep in keep in mind what do we mean by when we talk about difficulty to practice though? Like some brothers say, Oh, I can't wear my thobe. I'm out. I can't practice my wearing a thobe is not practicing religion. That's not part of the deen. Give me a verse in the Quran where it says, Oh, you who believe, wear your thobe. Where the Prophet commanded believers to wear thobes? No. That is more of an Islamic dress or more like a Muslim dress. It's a cultural thing. The men are commanded to cover their private parts. Right? They're commanded when they pray to cover their shoulders. So they should have something on top and on the bottom. That's Islamic. That's as, that's as Islamic as it gets for men. Women have to cover everything. Difference of opinion whether it comes to the face or the hands. Right? That's Islamic. And the, and the clothes for the women has, has to be baggy. It has to be loose fitting so that their shape is not, uh, is not shown. That's Islamic. 
Anything outside of that framework is mostly cultural. Now, does some of the culture um, habits, does it better fall in line with some of the Islamic, well, what Islam um, compels us to do? Okay, for example, when the sister wears the, the, the jilbab, does it cover more of her body? And in a better way than if she was to wear some loose shirt and loose dress or whatever it is these people wear here? Yes, it does. It meets the goal better. But when a sister decides that, you know, well, I don't have that. You know, she decides to do what is obligatory and not what's best. Do we rag her out for that? Do we, you know, um, treat her like an outcast for that? No, no, we don't. But what we should do is like, you know, sis, when you have the opportunity, when you're able to, the best thing for you to do is X, Y, and Z, right? Because that is more, that fulfills the obligation better. Same thing, you know, when a brother comes to the masjid, what's the best way for him to be around the Muslim brothers and stuff like that? And when he's praying and stuff like that, to better cover his private parts? He don't have to, when you wear pants, some of those pants sometimes, brothers be going in, in, in sujood and you can see the crack of their butts. That happens. Brothers, you can't, I mean, you, I don't, it's just the way those garments are made, it's hard to cover up certain things. Right? So what better does that? At Izzar, better covers up those areas. A, a, a foe better covers up those areas. So it's good to always try to do what is best to meet those obligations. At the same time, if those obligations can be met other than other ways, might not be best, might just be borderline covering, that's okay. Because we have to remember that there was time during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when companions only had garment that covered up one of their parts of their body, either the top or the bottom. And some of them would have to switch. Right? They would have to, the, the shirt that they wear that covered up the top and only their private parts, they had to put that below their, to cover up their waist. Because they know that when they go into rukur, when they go into prostration, that that, Garment was not going to be enough to cover their private parts. So they did with what they had. Right? Okay, so with that, uh, how much time we got until the Salah comes? Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. So that's all we got to do as far as that hadith. Well, I got a question. Go ahead, Tafadbal. So I've, I've heard uh, a situation where um, the sister was wearing the women have to be covered a certain type of way mm -hmm. and so forth. But wherever you are, is it true that you're encouraged to dress the way that the people in, the, in that particular region dress as long as it's, that you, you're covered correctly? Okay, okay, so the question is, is there any truth to the fact that, you know, wherever you are, wherever you live, whatever the custom of the people are when it comes to dress, that you should dress like them? Okay, that, there's some the details in those issues and stuff like that. The general answer to that is yes. Yes. Why? Because of something called shuhra, which is impermissible in Islam. Shuhra is dressing to stand out. And that is not permissible in Islam. Right? So for you to dress just to stand out, like you know that everybody dresses in suit and tie or whatever the case may be, and you decide that you're going to wear something that nobody else wears, No, they're not used to seeing that, whatever like that, you know, and say, so you decide to put that on, that's impermissible. You should not seek to stand out with your dress in, in Islam. With that being said, the whole world is kind of a global society now. Most people are used to most forms of dressing in most places. Are there pockets of places where that's not the case? Yes. If you go to Hicksville, somewhere in America, you know, where, every, where there's a church in every, you know, back bush somewhere. These people are not accustomed to seeing people wearing clothes. The first thing they're going to think is Osama. You know, and try to probably shoot. You think you probably blow up something. No, it's for real. No, I mean, that, that happens. And it would not be wise for a person to then try to dress 
in a way that goes against what they're used to. In fact, in fact, it would probably be stupid to do so, especially when it's not something that's obligatory. It's not obligatory for you to dress like that anyway. Allah, 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 Okay, now, before we move on to, to fifth, inshallah, I'd like to address the sisters when it comes to the issue of shuhra, right? Uh, the issue of standing out with your dress. Um, like in Africa, the sisters there, from the norm, majority of them wear colorful, you know, jilbabs, you know, with African printed colors and things like that. I haven't been to everywhere in Africa, so I can't speak in general. I'm just, you know, uh, speaking, you know, just loosely right now. That, you know, if you were to go to certain places and you were to wear, like, you know, maybe some sisters, they wear all black, all brown, all blue, whatever the case may be. You know, um, you wearing that there will have you standing out. And even though what they wear is something that is fulfilling the obligation which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed upon you. So you have to be careful about those type of situations. Now, like I said, most the majority of the world now is global. Most people under, they won't even look at you twice, even though you dress differently than them. They're like, oh, okay, she's wearing the, the Saudi garb or she's wearing the Yemeni garb or whatever it is, the Somalian garb. They'll, they'll understand and they'll keep it moving. You know, it won't, it won't deter anyone distract them confuse them think you're something that you're not or anything like that in most places but we have to use hikmah we have to use wisdom when it comes to how we deal with our surroundings and the people within them okay all right so we covered about the things that are disliked in the prayer and just to mention some of them like you know looking around while praying um you're looking around while praying is disliked. Also, what is dislike is praying while you need to use the bathroom. Yeah. Right? Um, that is disliked. Also, what is dislike is closing your eyes while praying. Closing your eyes while praying is dislike. Um, unless there's a benefit to closing it. Right, like you know, if there's too many distractions, and the reason why it's disliked is because that's how the Jews and the Christians pray, and we're always encouraged to be different than the Jews and the Christians. Okay, um, so those are some of the things you know, sitting like a dog. We've talked about the different interpretation of what that means to sit like a dog uh, during the prayer and uh, so forth. Okay, so now what we're going to cover here, we're going to cover those things that will invalidate the prayer now. Those things that will invalidate the prayer. Okay. So there are seven things that the, 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 the Sheikh he mentions. One is talking. Talking during the prayer. And what we're talking about here is anything. See, the, the, the way that they describe talking only really is like something that, you know, someone who knows Arabic or speaks Arabic would have to worry about. Could they say something that's made out of uh, two, two, um, letters or more that it actually is a word so anything that's made of two letters or more that's actually a word it would be like you know, I, I think we don't have anything like that i think the the shortest word we have is three letters like hey you know um i don't know do you know if any uh two-letter words i don't think there's any two-letter words in english 
Right. Huh? Be quiet. Be. Be. Yes, but be quiet is two words. So, you know, we're talking about two letter words. Yeah, two letter words. So I, I only could think of three letters, like hey, um, shh, even sh, sh is SH, right? There you go. <laughs> you follow what you had? It? It is two letter. Yes. So, so we do have some. So, like, say for instance, if we pray and somebody is doing something, and you go, you go shh. Yeah, that, that will that will invalidate your prayer. That will invalidate your prayer. Okay, um, <clears throat> eating and drinking, invalidate your prayer. So chewing gum then is not something that you should be doing, right? What about praying with sunglasses? Um, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Um, clearing the throat. Clearing, yes, clearing the throat. They'll say, I go, Ugh. unless you have a reason. Like clearing it for no reason will invalidate your prayer. But like if you like, for example, if you're reciting and you need to clear your throat, or if you, your throat is itchy and you clear, that is a reason. But just doing that for no reason invalidates your prayer. Uh, mm. uh, I ain't gonna say what mine or what brothers they used to always belch perfect like and they used to, his brothers used to do it, these other brothers used to do it. When they it's, it's like a fad, that's all they their belch and the do him <coughs> or, or belch and so it so what is that I mean if you I mean how do you know that they're doing it on purpose? Yeah, I mean they've been doing it for do years, you? over every every slot. I mean sometime, that sometimes two or three times during the slot. That's something that yeah that might that might fall into that. That might. And I mentioned it to to a brother, and he told me not a, a he's a learned brother, but he said I didn't know that that might be a value because I said to brother when you cause a disturbance in any kind of way during the slot, your slot is not valid because the shape. Lion Hagum told me that years ago, thirty years ago, he said any disturbance mm -hmm. among. People when they in in, 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 in congregation of Salat, mm -hmm. and you call someone to look around or or, or call someone to. Uh, I should have repeated your question too, so I forgot. There's people that can't hear what you're saying and stuff. Huh? No, nothing. I'm just thinking out loud. Um, okay. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. Hold on, let me let's try and get the uh, here. Go ahead. Uh, I was about to um, piggyback on what he said. Okay, so they're talking about uh, people who make uncontrollable noises in the salat, or maybe it's intentional, like, you know, burping and things like that, belching. Um, so the, the, the second question was, what if it's uncontrollable? Like, what you said, what was the name of that? Tourette's, Tourette's syndrome. They don't have that, huh? It, I, don't a, I don't know. I mean, I do, I do remember some people used to always do that. I, I do remember seeing that. Oh, they don't have not, the, okay. Not these people, um, no. uh, um, uh, this is, it, it, you know, where, where I used to go, and, and, and they're married, and there's another brother picked it up, and he says, do it too, and he leave. And I asked him why he did it. He said, brother, you know, I'm just enjoying my food, showing the special, I'm enjoying my food. I said, In the prayer? No, I no. Said, you can't do that. Belch it, that's a rock. So <laughs> Folks, it's funny, man. Said, they can't do that. <laughs> okay, so let's continue, because I, I do want to wrap this up quick. Um... Okay, so we covered making. Okay, so we covered clearing your throat, making sounds. Uh, will invalidate if, of course, there's no, you know if there, if it's not if there's no reason to do so. Replying to external forces. Okay, what this means is that you know you're praying, and somebody comes to you. Maybe they don't know you're praying and say that you know is the heat on, or something like that, or you know, or or is the door open, or something like that while you're praying. And you try to be smart, you're reciting, your, your, you're reciting from the Quran, and you know a verse in the Quran that would answer their question. So you decide that you're going to use that verse, recite it out loud, and hope that they understand that you're answering their question by reciting that loud. That invalidates the prayer if you do that. That invalidates the prayer. Okay? You have to intend by your recitation to address your Lord, not address anybody else. Okay, and some people can do that. You know, there was this one, I, I don't think she was a, a, a companion. I think she might have been a, a, a tabi'in, a, a, a student of a companion that used to, her whole life, she spoke in Quran. You ever heard about that? Yeah, yeah. She, so anytime you ask her a question or she will uh, talk to somebody, she finds something in the Quran to use to speak or to address somebody or answer their question with. 
Uh, you know, some of the scholars found that to be a little extreme and stuff like that. But, you know, there's people like that. Anyway, continuing on. Excessive movements. Excessive movement. Fixing your pants, fixing your shirt. You know what I'm saying? Fixing the carpet. Right. Whatever. So what, what's considered? How many times is considered? That, see, that, now, notice how they left it general. They didn't say, some people, they say like three movements or, or something like that. That's excessive movement is to be left general. Because in different circumstances, it might vary. Like what's considered, like a person taking their phone out of their pocket and turning it off, then putting it back in their pocket. Is that excessive? No. You know, because they did the exact limited amount of movements they needed to do to get that, that act done, to make their slot more valid. Because usually they do that so they can concentrate on their prayer. Right? So things like that. So you have to consider that. Um, if, you were, if you're going to prestration and there are 20 rocks in your way, you know what I'm saying? You might need to do this more than three times. You might need to brush them out of your way more than three times. Whatever you need to do in order to make your salat uh, be correct, but not going above that. Yes. I said like the best thing to do while, while, while that's happening is just do it before you start doing Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. Definitely the best thing for you to do so you won't have to make excessive movements in the prayer is to do it before the prayer. No doubt. Okay, next thing is, the last thing is, turning your body away from the tibla. Turning your body away from the direction of prayer will invalidate your prayer in the, uh, well, will invalidate your prayer. <laughs> I was going to say in the salat, but, yeah, flood up. Uh, I, I was told this a long time ago, you never point your foot, like, if I stretch my foot out towards another brother or mm -hmm. towards the kaaba. Is that, is that true? That or is. is that a sign of disrespect. Yeah, well, you see, that's the problem, right? Because that's disrespect in a culture, right? And that will differ from culture to culture. But in general, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Um, like, but it, it's, especially to the Kaaba, like, especially, but when it comes to, like, in general, like, people, because for us, that's not an issue, right? So you got to be careful who you're around. The Arabs, that's a big sign. I mean, they'll fight over that and stuff like that, you know? You put your foot, your, your, your foot towards them and stuff. But, um, yeah, I mean, if we're around people, that, that's not an issue. That's not a problem. But you shouldn't do it towards a cop, but because of just, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that some people might view that as a, as a disrespect. You don't know who is watching you and things like that. And definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. We want to make sure that, you know, even... And, and it, it reminds me of the issue of, you know, being naked, right? Um, even in times when it's permissible for you to be naked, nobody's around. You can be naked. But even in times like that, the Prophet used to always like to cover himself. And the reason for that because there's somebody who has more right that he be shy of than the people, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? I, I, and somebody told me that. I ain't gonna, I don't want to mention the name. Mm -hmm. I, would say, I would say, bro, when you get out of the shower, you put your cosmetics on. You don't make voodoo in the shower. Mm -hmm. But you know, you got to put your deodorant on, your, your body lotion or grease or whatever mm -hmm. on your body. Mm -hmm. They say if you touch yourself, Powder. yourself mm -hmm. your voodoo is unvalid. Is that that is an opinion. But what, what about if you, like, you got to put cosmetics on? Well, you got to put cosmetic on and all that stuff, yes. So what some of them do, you, you got to use, like, a, if you take that opinion, you got to use, like, a glove or stuff like that. <laughs> or you put that on, then you make wudu again. Because your, your ghusl still counts. What you do when you do it, you break your wudu. So when you make, when you do all of that stuff, you just got to make wudu again. Or use a, a, a barrier between your, you know, like a glove or something like that. So you won't break your wudu. But, you know, that's, that's an opinion. And that's not the opinion I go by. You know, um, you can touch your private parts and it won't break your wudu and stuff like that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So with that, we say, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Wa shahadu an la ilaha illa ant. Wa saghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum Ready? Yeah, here's Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah.